You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting The Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. We have an interesting anniversary to mark this week. Yes, this is very exciting, actually. It is. There's a, a quite, it's just an interesting history of Lutherans in North America. And we're going to dig into that today yeah. with two just wonderful professors from two different Lutheran church bodies in North America. Joining us today, the Reverend Dr. John Brenner. He's a minister of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod and Professor Emeritus of Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary in Mequon, Wisconsin. Dr. Brenner, welcome to the Coffee Hour. Thank you. Also joining us today, the Reverend Dr. Cameron McKenzie, a minister of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and Professor of Historical Theology at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Dr. McKenzie, welcome back to the Coffee Hour. Thank you. Glad to be here. So the occasion we're marking today is the 150th anniversary. Well, it's actually July 10th when this occurs. The the anniversary of the 150th anniversary of the Evangelical Lutheran Synodical Conference of North America. How many Lutheran words could we put together in one (laughs) phrase? We're good at that. (laughs) So the and in the German it was even better, but I can't pronounce that, so I will leave that to the experts. So the Evangelical Lutheran Synodical Conference of North America formed in 1872. This is a lot of history. So 150 years ago. So who made up the Lutherans in North America in the mid to late 1800s? Dr. Brenner, would you like to start us off? Yes, we probably need to talk about the major groupings because Mm -hmm. in the history of the United States, there's been probably over 100 Lutheran synods. But in the mid uh, mid to late 19th century, would have been synods in the East that were banded together in the General Synod. It was a federation of about several of the Eastern groups formed in 1820. And then there was another group formed in 1867 called the General Council. And that group formed because of the lack of confessionalism in the General Synod. And of course, the big name in the foundation of the General Council would then uh, Croth, K-R-A-U-T-H, Charles Porterfield Croth, who was kind of a giant of American Lutheranism. The problem With the general council at that time is that their practice didn't always match up with their confession. And for that reason, the Missouri Synod and the Ohio Synod never joined. The Wisconsin Synod was a member of the general council for a short time. But when the general council didn't come up with good statements on the four points, the Wisconsin Synod said, sorry, we cannot stay in this body, turned to Missouri Synod, and in 1868, met in colloquy in 1869, formal declarations of fellowship between the two synods, which helped set the stage for the founding of this radical conference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dr. McKenzie, do you you have some more history you'd like to add to that? Just a quick comment uh, to emphasize something that Dr. Brenner said, and that is the concern of the founders of the Synodical Conference was that your practice actually match your words. In other words, if you say you're Lutheran, you say you subscribe to the Lutheran confessions, then your practice has to show that as well. And that was what was wrong with the general council. And so the synodical conference brought together Lutherans who were committed both to speaking the truth and then to acting upon those truth principles. So that was the big difference, I think, between us and the general council. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is very interesting early history of our Lutheran synods in America. I know I've run across a lot of this history in a lot of the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcasts just because of all of the structure that was happening in, in the America in this time. It's very interesting that these different conferences have all these different parts of our history all kind of baked in. It's very interesting. Dr. McKenzie, can you share with us a little bit more about what made each of these groups unique in, in what their beliefs or their practices or both? Uh, Sure. I mean, the first point is that if you're going to be one church, then you should be able to preach uh, the word of God together so that, but if you're not confessing or practicing the same thing, you shouldn't be preaching the word of God together. And the 
practice of the Lord's Supper follow the same ideas, that that's predicated upon agreement in what you believe, teach, and confess. Moreover, there was a, and I think this is still true in Lutheranism, there is an inherent drive to not only to worship together when we agree together, but actually to do the work of the church when we agree together. And so I think it was at the first meeting of the Synodical Conference that C.F.W. Walther, who was the first president of the Synodical Conference, gave a presentation on the reason for the conference was the salvation of souls, that we not only have this truth of the gospel upon which we're agreed, but then that we actually preach it, teach it, spread it, and we're better when we're doing that together than if we're doing that in isolation. So I think that is a part of the ethos of 19th century confessional Lutheranism, that we have this truth and we want to get it out. And that is one of the things that the Synodical Conference did. So it's better when we can work, learn, serve, worship together, when we can say, but only when we can say amen together, mm-hmm. when we can't say amen, when there's disagreement and that presents challenges is what I'm hearing. Dr. Brenner, you started, you, you gave us a nice synopsis of the history that, that led up to the conference. Tell us more about the groups that, that formed then this conference. Well, and I find it interesting that the impetus really came from the Ohio Senate. The, they had been traveling in a more confessional direction, probably with the immigration of more and more confessional Lutherans from Germany settling in the Midwest. Matthias Loy would be their primary theologian, and he was always very sympathetic with the Missouri Synod. Well, the Ohio Synod and the Missouri Synod declared fellowship about the same time that Wisconsin and Missouri did. The Norwegian Synod had always been uh, in fellowship with the Missouri Synod. So those would have been the major groups. You also have the Minnesota Synod, which today would be part of the Wisconsin Synod. Three synods merged in 1917 to form the long name Evangelical Lutheran Joint Synod of Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan, and other states. In 1959, did we shorten that name, 1959. Also, the Illinois Synod was able to be one of the founding members. The Illinois Synod will end up being part of the Missouri Synod. What kind of discussions were happening? How did the leaders determine that this was a good idea and a good thing to move forward in our church history? What, well, if I can answer that just briefly, I mean, the one that the one thing that they had in common initially was that they all found the uh, general council inadequate. And when they expressed that, and it turned out that they were thinking the same way about the inadequacies of the general council, it made sense then for them to examine their own relationships. Dr. Brenner made a nice point, though, about how there was a tendency through the course of the 19th century for Lutherans in America actually become more Lutheran, more confessional than they had been at the beginning of the century. The Ohio Synod was a good example of that. The, some of the founders of the Missouri Synod had broken from the Ohio Synod because it wasn't particularly confessional. And I know. Dr. Brenner will know this history much better than I do, but the Wisconsin Synod likewise had started in a, with a somewhat less than strong confessional position, and then it too moved in the direction of stronger confessionalism. So you had both of those things going, a tendency toward confessionalism that then manifested itself very strongly by discontent with the less than strong confessionalism of the general council. Dr. Brenner, anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, yeah, it made excellent points. I, one of the dates I would maybe want to point to would be 1855, when a few men in the general synod, Samuel Simon Schmucker being the main author, sent out the definite synodical platform to Lutheran pastors throughout the United States, and that platform contained an American recension of the Augsburg Confession, which basically gutted the Augsburg Confession of anything that was Lutheran, so that, you know, he wanted Lutherans to match more of the generic Protestantism that had developed in America. 
Well, the Wisconsin Synod at the time, even though it wouldn't have been, uh, nobody would have accused that Synod of being overly confessional in 1856, reacted to that definite synodical platform by Synod resolution calling it the definite suicide of the Lutheran Church. <laughs> that document also prompted Walther to call for a series of free conferences, free in the sense that those who attended had to subscribe to the Augsburg Confession and wouldn't come as official delegates of any synod because he said that's got to be our starting point and then we can work to see whether there's agreement or not. Probably the General Council also came out in a certain extent from those free conferences, but as was mentioned, the General Council's practice didn't match its confession on paper. And then the General Council did not take the best stands on uh, four points, pulpit all fellowship, altar fellowship, secret societies, and kiliasm. The Wisconsin Synod developed greater confessionalism with the coming of John Bodding from Germany. He had been trained at Hermannsburg, which was a confessional Lutheran school in Germany. Philip Kaler would have been one of the early confessional men, and then Adolf Heineke, who came with a university education, not a mission house education, and became really the great theologian of the Wisconsin City. And even Heineke, in his first few years in America, really grew more confessional as well. I find it interesting that the very thing that Lutherans were so bold to confess and leave, many left Germany, fleeing unionism, came to the United States. And then here we see again that very same issue coming up, being pressured to to join with other church bodies of different confessions for a more, I don't know, blended, confused, heterodox <laughs> confession. And so the, yeah. these bold Lutherans were so bold as to say this is not what we believe, mm -hmm. to join with those we do believe. So how did, uh, Dr. Brenner, how did, oh man, we need to take a break. But when we come back, I want to talk about how, the, uh, how they marked the occasion of joining together in conference. We'll do that in just a moment. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. <laughs> At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason, to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live uncommon. Welcome back to the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golsa. I'm so deep into this history. I'm forgetting the schedule. We actually have a schedule that we have to follow. So today we're talking with Reverend Dr. John Brenner, a minister of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod and Professor Emeritus of Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary in Mequon, Wisconsin, and the Reverend Dr. Cameron McKenzie, a minister of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and Professor of Historical Theology at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're talking about the occasion of the 150th anniversary of the Evangelical Lutheran Synodical Conference of North America. That anniversary takes place July 10th. And so before we went to break, Dr. Brenner, just getting ready to talk about how the occasion was marked the, the, of these church bodies joining together in the Synodical Conference. How did they mark that occasion? Well, they had some preliminary meetings to, you know, make sure that they were all on the same page and also to say, why they couldn't join with any of the existing groups. When they hammered that out, the first convention of the Synodical Conference was July 10th through 16, 1872, at St. John's Lutheran Church in Milwaukee, happened to be served by President John Bodding of the Wisconsin Synod. I feel a connection to that congregation because my grandfather served at that congregation for about 50 years. Oh, wow. The opening sermon was delivered by Walther, 
Um, First Timothy 4.16, the theme was, how important it is that we above all make the saving of souls the purpose of our joint work in the kingdom of Christ. And there were two essays that were presented, and I think these two essays were really very significant in charting the course uh, for the Synodical Conference. Matthias Lloyd presented, what is our task toward the English-speaking people of our country? And that certainly was aimed at, well, mission work. You know, we're here not just to serve German Lutherans, but to reach out to everyone with the gospel. And then Friedrich Schmidt, who has a Missouri background at the time was serving the Norwegian Synod, presented theses on justification. Of course, the doctrine that Luther would say, the doctrine of which the church stands or falls. And of course, one of the reasons for that, not only is because it's such a key doctrine of the Bible and the Lutheran confessions, but at the time, particularly among Scandinavian Lutherans, there was a controversy over what we today would call objective or universal justification. The Scandinavians would usually call it the justification of the world. And so Schmidt also weaves into that essay some theses on that also. So that we're, you know, we're all on the same page on this key doctrine right from the start. Dr. McKenzie, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think that the first convention kind of sets the tone for the Synodical Conference. I mean, for one thing, they are worshiping together. And through the course of its history, Synodical Conference pastors, uh, congregations, and people did worship together. And then they talked about the importance of doctrine. And when you look at the history of the Synodical Conference, or indeed of the Wisconsin Senate or the Missouri Senate through that same period of time, when they meet, they talk about doctrine. They have these essays that are serious treatments of what the Word of God says about basic topics. And often the topics come out of a context in which there's controversy or in which there is a movement that is calling these things into question. So they, they continue to be interested in doctrine. And then again, as Dr. Brenner pointed out, they're talking about mission work, mission work among the English speakers of the United States. And really within a very short period of time, they're actually doing mission work. And the first mission field that they established by the end of the 1870s is among the freedmen, the ex-slaves of the South, trying to plant confessional Lutheranism among the Afro-Americans. So the first convention actually, I think, sets the tone for what the Synodical Conference will actually be in the decades following. So, Dr. McKenzie, can you give us more of that history of what the Synodical Conference was able to accomplish over its lifetime? Yeah, well, I think the first thing that we should realize is that a lot of the Lutheran churches in black areas of the South have their origins in that uh, Synodical Conference work that was begun late 1870s. The mission board of the Synodical Conference, looking around for opportunities to serve, decided that the time was right to move into the South. Now, there already were a few Missouri Synod congregations in the South, in New Orleans, for example. And eventually, they began work among the Black Americans in New Orleans. And they did it often by starting schools in which to educate and Christianize people. And then from there, they established congregations. Probably the main man who did the work in those early years was somebody who came out of the Norwegian Lutheran community. His name was Niels Bakke. And he spent good 30 years in different parts of the South promoting that particular work. And the Synodical Conference supported. There were other men who were sent, other churches that were founded. Great story about Rosa Young from rural Alabama contacting the Synodical Conference and the Synodical Conference through Bakke, helping her to maintain a school in Rosebud, Alabama, and bringing lots of other people to the church that way. Establishing schools in North Carolina, there was an Emanuel Lutheran College and then seminary for the training of men for the ministry. So that work was really important over the several decades and actually continued until the 
modern era of the civil rights movement and then the breakup of the synodical conference. But a lot of those congregations still exist today and still are preaching and teaching the gospel to the people in those areas. Well, I see we should have made this a five-part episode. Yep. <laughs> Dr. Brenner, can you give us some of the highlights of other events in the timeline of the Synodical Conference? Talk in the early years or? More the latter years and what led up to the dissolve of the conference. Oh, okay. Yes. The conference was started, at least from the Wisconsin City point of view, started experiencing some problems all oh, about 1938. Or the election controversy had raged at the end of the 19th century. There were attempts to resolve. Well, that's when the Ohio Synod actually left the Synodical Conference over the issue of election. They were teaching election in view of faith. There were efforts in the first part of the 20th century to resolve that, a series of free conferences. Uh, then there was a group that started out a mixed conference in Minnesota that tried to work on it ended up, well, ultimately with what the former Synodical Conference Synods would call the Chicago Theses. Unfortunately, the Chicago Theses didn't really resolve the controversy because they left room for the teaching of election in view of faith. Uh, the Missouri Synod in 1929 actually rejected those theses as inadequate, and the Wisconsin Synod went along with that. And then in the late 30s, Missouri Synod was meeting with representatives of the American Lutheran Church. Now, the American Lutheran Church was made up of a merger of the Ohio Synod, the Iowa Synod, and the Buffalo Synod. Ohio and Iowa were on the opposite side of the election controversy, and they made a declaration at their synod convention that the declaration of the theologians of the ALC and the brief statement of the Missouri Synod would serve as the basis for future church fellowship. And that's when the Wisconsin students started raising some questions, and also questions were raised by a number in the Missouri Synod. Then there was an attempt to make one confessional statement, the doctrinal affirmations is yes. what it was called. Yeah, right. Yes. And that uh, didn't satisfy the ALC, and so that kind of ceased being used. And then the common confession, which tried to answer concerns from the ELS and the Wisconsin Synod over the moves towards fellowship. The Wisconsin Synod and the ELS rejected the common confession, not so much for what it said, but for what it left unsaid, and not with, you know, good negativa, uh, eliminating any possibility of a misunderstanding of what the confession was or what it was rejecting. The you know, things seemed to keep going in the direction of dividing the two synods. A committee was set up to see, are we still in doctrinal agreement or not? And they started out hammering out some agreements, came up with a pretty good statement on the doctrine of Scripture, but they could not come up with a satisfactory statement on the doctrine of fellowship. And that indicated that by oh, about 1960, there was definitely a difference in the doctrine of fellowship in the ELS and the Wisconsin Synod as opposed to the Missouri Synod and the Slovak Synod. The ELS broke fellowship with the Missouri Synod in 1955, Wisconsin Synod in 1961, and of course the Synodical Conference then disbanded in 1963. Dr. McKenzie, any recommended reading on this history? The Standard History was written by Armin Schutze some years back, and that's really the place where all the history is. In addition to that, probably in the, oh yeah, there's Marcus Brown also did one, I think it's called The Tale of Two Synods. It talks about the breakup of the Wisconsin and the Missouri Synods, and that's a good one. I mentioned Rosa Young. Her autobiography talks about synodical conference work in rural Alabama through her perspective. So those would be some that I would mention. 
Dr. Brenner? Those are the main ones I would mention, too. I wrote a book on the election controversy, particularly the 20th century aspects of it, and carried it through the breakup of the Synodical Conference. That's also available. It happened to be my PhD dissertation at Marquette University. So that would also add some. But Armin Schitzis is really, I would say, the stand, the first real history of the Synodical Conference. And I understand that our friends at the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod will be gathering together to mark the occasion of the 150th anniversary of the conference coming up Sunday, July 10th, at St. John Lutheran Church in Milwaukee. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. That church is located on 8th and Bleet Street. It's the congregation where the first meeting of the Synodical Conference took place. It's not exactly the same location because the current church was built in 1890, but there will be a service commemorating the event, and then there will also be an essay presentation by Pastor Peter Prangy. Well, with thanks be to God for what we've learned in this history today. Mm-hmm. And I am so thankful to our guest today, the Reverend Dr. John Brenner, a minister of the Wisconsin Ev- Evangelical Lutheran Synod and professor emeritus at Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary in Mequon, Wisconsin. Dr. Brenner, thank you for being our guest today. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed speaking with you. And the Reverend Dr. Cameron McKenzie, Minister of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, and Professor of Historical Theology at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Dr. McKenzie, thanks for being our guest again today. It was my pleasure, and I just wish we had another half hour to talk some more. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golson. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you anytime, anywhere. Anywhere.